Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy Lloyd, and I'm a production designer and technical designer. And over the past 28 years, I've been working on large-scale productions uh, all over the world, mostly specializing in uh, ceremonies and uh, large-scale music tours, generally sort of stadium-scale shows. And today I'd like to share with you uh, some of what we learned last year whilst we were developing the design for a new music tour. But first of all, I thought I'd start by delving back into a little bit of history uh, to look at some of the equipment that was being used when I started out in the industry working at Theatre Project Lighting back in 1990. So many theatrical productions at the time used things like the Strand Pattern 252 effects projector, still a classic, I think, uh, with various effects such as uh, rain, clouds and flames. And the effects themselves were hand-painted glass discs that were mounted into a rotator mechanism. And the mechanism was mounted onto the front of the projector, and then various lenses could be used attached to the front of the effect. And then the images were then projected onto scenery or backdrops and were very much part of the lighting design, which allowed them to adjust the lighting levels and balance everything uh, to achieve a really good effect. And then for um, concerts and uh, various other sort of dance events, you'd often find the uh, Optikinetics Solar 250, which had things such as the uh, sort of classic oil wheel effect. And they were very much flavor of the month or decade it might have been um, back then. Um, and these were a very small and cost-effective way of delivering interesting uh, lighting effects at the time. There wasn't much else around, really. On the larger scale events, um, the hardware for Xenon projectors and ETC PG scrollers started to become a familiar sight. And as the name would suggest, the projectors themselves utilized um, a Xenon lamp, which provided uh, much higher light output, um, and a, you know, more so than a traditional filament lamp. The PG scrollers took a traditional sort of slide transparency and they joined them together to create a long scroll. And then these could be used to change either just between individual images or they could be used more creatively to uh, produce interesting moving images, graphics or dissolves between images. And back in 2002, um, the ETC PG system was used to great effect on um, a couple of the two biggest events that year. Um, one of them was the uh, Queen's Golden Jubilee, and this is on the facade of uh, Buckingham Palace. Uh, and they would dissolve into different images. And the projection was also integrated into a, a big uh, lighting show with pyro. Um, and it was yeah, quite a spectacle with thousands of people all the way up the mall. Also that year was um, the Manchester Commonwealth Games and the PG scrollers were used uh, on the field of play. There was a big field cloth um, let's have a quick look here. So yeah, on the field here, there's a cloth all the way across and the projectors were mounted up in the roof. And uh, honestly, at the time, they, they really weren't that bright. It was balanced for TV, but if you were in the stadium, you couldn't really see the images so well. So we were learning. Um, around that time, sort of video projection was starting to become sort of more commonplace um, with new projector models coming out all the time, uh, always promising sort of higher light levels, um, you know, better images, better quality. But video projection still really wasn't bright enough for any of these out outdoor productions, so it wasn't really an option. During this time, um, LED screens were also sort of breaking into the market with products such as the uh, Star Vision and Jumbotron becoming more regular sites on some of the larger sort of arena and stadium shows. Um, the Star Vision container, it was a containerized unit, it weighed something like sort of 20 odd tons and uh, yeah, it was sort of, I don't know, it was sort of four, four and a half meters tall. 
So it didn't actually fit into Wembley Stadium on the back of the truck. You had to crane it off and then tow it in on some machine skids with a sort of little gooseneck trailer. Um, and I sort of first witnessed this myself um, in 92 during the Freddie Mercury tribute build, which was uh, yeah, in itself quite a big spectacle at the time. And following that, really, it was Jumbotron, which certainly, as I, I remember, was the, one of the next things that would be on a lot of the tours. And by comparison to the Star Vision, it was a much, much lighter weight screen and much easier to, to handle. And prior to the bigger and more powerful projectors uh, being available, the more traditional 35mm film projectors were still being used for a lot of tours. And here you can see um, some drawings from the original wall tour uh, in 1980. Um, and they, they were doing back projection onto the circular screen from this little tower back here. Because this is a view from behind the stage. And also as the wall was built, they do projection onto the front surface of the wall. Uh, and here you can see uh, the rear, rear projection on the circular screen. So that was, for its time, very uh, groundbreaking. Even as late as 1994, um, Pink Floyd were using film projection still on their circular screen on the Division Bell tour. And here you can see the projectors mounted on towers behind the huge arch stage structure, providing rear projection onto their circular screen. And uh, yeah, here it is in action, again, and one of the groundbreaking shows of its time. And by the time Roger Waters restaged the wall in 2010, there was really no question about using um, video projection. It was really the way forward. Um, and if you were lucky enough to see that show, um, I don't know if you've ever wondered how the projection seamlessly appeared on each brick. So as each brick was placed, the projection image would um, appear onto the brick. Um, and basically that was all done with just a lot of planning, um, a lot of rehearsals, um, and a cue sheet. And uh, each, as each brick was placed, it was placed in exactly the same position every single night of the show. And the crew had to practice it over and over and over again. Um, and as they placed a brick, someone front of house at the console would push a button and the projector would just dissolve up. It would unmask each brick as they went around. So here's, here's uh, just for fun, the sequence of cue sheets so on the sheet, see the, the bold number was the first brick to go down in the sequence. And then each sort of section of bricks, they'd be built, built in chunks. And they'd just work the way all the way across the wall with someone just hitting a button as they went. And then once they got to the last sort of centre section, they'd actually build from, from the outside. So they'd build from the outside in. I think they were probably getting bored at this point of uh, carrying bricks around. <laughs> so we'd unmask multiple bricks at a time. Until they're nearly, just a few more to go, done. However, these days, of course, I think that would actually be automated, probably. Although it would be a bit tedious having a battery pack in every single brick with an emitter or something in it. But that's, that would be how people would try to do it now. Another less visual, but or certainly not intentionally visual, uh, important part of the show is the audio. And back in the early 1990s, uh, before the advent of line array PA systems, uh, the loudspeakers comprise huge hangs of large boxes, such as you know, this system here, the turbo sound flashlight. And I, do, I do know some people actually that think the systems were rather pleasing to the eye, but uh, <laughs> you have to be in the, the right field, I think. So I've only touched on a very few products and technology here. Um, there's so many things, thousands of things have been and gone over the past sort of 20 to 30 years, impossible to cover them all. So I've only really mentioned technology that I was familiar with or that's sort of most relevant to the time. When compared with today's technology, all of this past technology has a number of things in common. Uh, the units were always large and they were heavy. The output wasn't particularly high and they used a disproportionately uh, large amount of power compared to the, uh, the light output. And then from a lighting perspective, it was always very difficult to balance the lighting levels, particularly for live television broadcast. I mean, that's still a problem today, but it's getting better and better all the time. Um, and it would look common for game you know, for projects such as Manchester Commonwealth Games, is a good example, to look rather underlit as they were trying to balance the projection with the lighting. 
So I'm going to talk now about um, the show we designed for last year. And it sort of started back in early 2016. And we embarked on the design for some one-off shows for Roger Waters. And the shows were to be staged at large outdoor sites, not the traditional sports stadia. Um, so this enabled the design to be sort of a very bold scale that was fitting to each location. And there were two locations in Mexico. One was at Forosol at the Me Mexican Formula One track. The other one was Zocalo Square in the middle of Mexico City. And there was also a third venue uh, in, in America, uh, in California, uh, at a big polo club where they hold the Coachella Music Festival each year. And the big look for these shows was the recreation of the Animals album cover, which depicted Battersea Power Station and uh, the infamous flying pig called Algae. So due to the scale of the sites for these outdoor shows, we were able to create a very large panoramic LED screen, measuring 80 meters wide by 12 meters tall. And that's this screen line running along the back edge here of the stage. And then the screen content obviously was um, completely specific for these shows due to its sort of wide format nature. The main building for Battersea Power Station was content that was displayed on the LED screen. Um, and then we created large automated inflatable chimneys that would raise up from behind the LED, LED screen sort of halfway through the show. So you can see the, screw, the chimneys either side here. So at the start of the show, they just weren't there. And there was no uh, sort of sign that they were going to appear. And also Algie the pig made a, a brief appearance here. Uh, rigged between two of the chimneys. So overall height-wise, I mean, they, these were, you know, sort of... I'm trying to remember now, it should be on this dimension here. But yeah, we were sort of 25 or 30 metres up in the air, so it's quite, a, it's quite a big spectacle. And then to add extra dimension, uh, images were projected onto algae and onto the chimneys. And then during the last of the one-off shows, we started work on the design for the tour that was going to be taking place in the spring of 2017. And the tour was to be a combination of classic Pink Floyd hits and some of Roger Waters' solo material from an album he was about to start recording at the end of 2016. And one of the creative concepts, again, uh, was to recreate some of the iconic images from uh, the Pink Floyd era, era. once again, including uh, the Animals album cover and Battersea Power Station. So, of course, the big challenge was how to recreate Battersea Power Station indoors on a much smaller scale, but still create something looking spectacular. So the first idea was this uh, inflatable power station. So these were very early drawings. So we had the power station here that, that was an inflatable that rose up from the stage. Um, and in the end, it was obviously we thought it's not really that practical, as feasible as it might be. Plus the scale of the band next to it, it just didn't look quite right. And also the viewing angles were strange because it's forced perspective. If you were in certain positions around the venue, it wouldn't look right. Then we explored the idea of making the show an in-the-round show with these four inflatable chimneys on the corner of the stage and these long projection screens running down in a big cross over the entire uh, arena. But this just really didn't work very well from a sightline perspective. So we sort of dism dismissed that idea and moved on. Um, next, we explored uh, a central spine of projection running down the length of the arena, uh, which seemed to be a better idea with an end on stage. Um, so we continued to develop the ideas from there. And then from a single projection surface, we ended up with two parallel surfaces, which would actually come in quite handy for another part of the show. And we didn't want to see two full height projection surface throughout the entire show. So we had to think of a creative way of deploying the surfaces that would work with the, uh, with the creative. So the initial thought was to uh, use multiple roll drops, which could be lowered using chain hoists and wire rope winches. Um, this concept worked, but it was quite heavy and it looked, looked a bit bulky. So then we discovered um, the new product in development. Uh, it didn't really have a name at the time. I think we started calling them magic screens, but in the end they, uh, they're called Rolios. 
And the Rolio screens comprise um, a pair of overhead winches, which are up the top here. Um, and then there's some tooth belt comes off the, the winch instead of a, a chain, uh, sorry, instead of a chain or a, uh, or a steel wire rope. And then at the top here, we have an eight inch uh, roller tube, which is the actual roll drop. Got the fabric and then a, a weighted tube at the bottom. Uh, and with this system, the projection screen can be lowered, fully rolled up, so you can lower the entire roll, up, roll drop down without seeing the support mechanism. And then you can unroll the screen from there. You can either take the top of the screen up, the bottom of the screen down, or you can wipe it open from the center. So you can create lots of really interesting looks. So the next challenge was how to reveal Battersea Power Station uh, and the chimneys from nowhere in the middle of an arena with 18,000 spectators watching. So we designed another inflatable solution, um, again here with some chimneys, and they lived in these large boxes which were actually clad. Um, and that enabled us to suspend those from the center of the grid, and they actually lived between the two screen surfaces, so they couldn't be seen when they were hidden. Um, but of course, some roll drop screens and uh, inflatable chimneys alone don't really provide much of a spectacle. So we had to project, you know, project some images onto those surfaces. The projection surfaces are suspended uh, in the middle of the venue on long winch lines, and they help to obviously accentuate the pendulum effect. And um, there are large amounts of unpredictable air movement within a venue, so uh, that's really not ideal for a screen surface, having a big object swinging around. To ensure that we could, as closely as possible, keep the projected images aligned with the correct surfaces, ideally without any distortion, we employed two methods. The first method was to provide live encoder feedback from the winch system so that the projectors could closely track the top and bottom of the screen as it went up and down. The second method was to use um, the VYV Photon media server with Albion 3D tracking system. And this uses the Kopernik infrared emitters uh, and infrared cameras the copper necks are mounted on the bottom corners of the projection surface on each rolio and in multiple locations around the perimeter of the chimneys. And the cameras were mounted adjacent to each of the projectors, which of which I can't remember the total quantity of projectors. There were big lines of them down each side of the, of the venue. Um, and then due to the layout, we got a good coverage across the entire venue. And here's the emitter layout on the chimneys and the pigs. And the advantage of this system is that if there's air movement in the venue, which there always is, as the bottom of the roll drop screen swings, then the projected image tracks that perfectly. So you never really lose any of the image. Equally, when the chimneys are rising and potentially moving around, they're again being tracked. So the image is always on the object as it swings around, even if the movement isn't particularly large. So now we had our scenic architecture um, that provided a projection surface uh, and we had a method of accurately tracking the surfaces as they moved. So all we need now was some bright high definition projectors to uh, finish the puzzle. So as touched on when recapping some of the past, I mentioned that projectors were not particularly bright and were big and heavy. So what we were after for this tour was some nice new bright projectors with lower power consumption and relatively small and lightweight. So we decided the way forward was to have a shootout between the sort of latest products. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and during the design process, another issue was raised, and this, this time one of uh, audio and not visual. So typically, uh, most arena shows, certainly sort of past 10 to 15 years, use uh, line array PA systems. Now, these are very efficient systems, and when tuned correctly, provide high quality audio. However, if someone decides to lower two rows of uh, projection uh, in between the main speaker arrays, then uh, the tuning of the PA is immediately ruined, which uh, didn't go down so well. So I'm just trying to get my thing back here. Um, so the other factor that had to be considered for this particular show is the surround sound as well, because um, Pink Floyd and Roger Waters have always been known for their sort of audio around the entire venue. 
They used to be quadraphonic and these days it's actually full on surround with six separate arrays um, around the venue. And they have a special mix for the audio. So one, one person employed just to mix the surround sound audio. So it decided to mock up the projection surface and the PA and test a few projectors. And the only way to properly test everything was to do it at full scale. And this way the production team could look, listen, and fully understand what it was they were proposing to uh, undertake. And that's before committing to quite a significant spend. So in December 2016, we carried out a test uh, in, a, in an arena in New Jersey. Um, it was very basic, but fairly extensive. And we hung different types of fabric so that we could understand what worked best for both projection and for audio. And here you can see one of the configurations with a couple of um, long trusses running down the length of the arena. And then these are the uh, quad PA arrays. In this case, there are three, but in reality, we ended up with six of those. And we tried hanging the fabric at different angles so we could see what worked best visually and sonically. So here we went to a, a sort of a V-shaped and there was an X shape here. And for each of these, we tested a selection of various projectors on the surfaces. And that was uh, yeah, just a few photos of the test. So as you can see, it's pretty basic, but it told us everything we needed to know. And what we concluded was that the uh, Panasonic 30K laser projector, which was brand new at the moment, it just come out. That was definitely the brightest and produced the best image. Uh, and had a consistent image over time as well. Um, and then the PA worked best with the parallel screens running straight out. Um, and the audio would be set up for different moments. So if the Rolio screens were out, then the projection was tuned, sorry, the uh, audio was tuned in one way. And when the screens came down, they'd actually have a, another preset which retuned the audio. So testing complete, we could uh, finalize the design. So in the end, it looked something a bit like this. We had a 28 meter wide LED screen, 12 meters high, which was the backdrop to the stage. And the stage was positioned immediately uh, just downstage. The LED screen is, is here, stage here. And then running down the center of the arena was a, a huge grid. And from that grid, we were suspending the the Rolio roll drops, the pig in a little uh, hamper here, and the chimneys all mounted in these positions. And then we have projection trusses running down either side and another projector at the far end here. So to reveal Battersea, the uh, closed Rolio roll drops and the chimney black boxes are lowered to just 12 feet above the audience. Well, ideally, we wanted to go lower, but People didn't really like the idea of people touching them. Um, and once they're at that level, the tops of the chimneys start to rise from these boxes. So they've come from black and they're just rising and projection is tracking them as they rise. And then once the chimneys get to full height, then the roll drop screens start to unroll. So it looks like the whole of Battersea has been plucked out of the ground and just lifted up uh, into the air. And then once the move is complete, you basically have Battersea Power Station just floating in the, uh, in the middle of the arena. And later in the show, we also use the roll drops for different effects. So in this case, for money, um, the chimneys have been taken away and the roll drops are doing a sort of a chase move with the projection tracking them. Here, we end up putting the roll drops at their full height and just using them as a conventional projection screen. And then for the end of the show, the roll drops are taken away again, and we just have a laser effect in this case, recreating the Dark Side of the Moon album cover with the, uh, with the big prism. So uh, what technical developments can we expect or hope for that will make the process quicker, easier, or more spectacular? We need to be more and more aware of the uh, impact we're having uh, on the planet and the way we're doing things. We need to find ways of using less energy, using fewer trucks, cargo ships, aeroplanes, less fuel, and generally use less of the planet's resources. This would all point toward um, more efficient equipment, 
so such as lighting sources, power supplies, amplifiers, and then the packaging of everything into smaller dimensions to take up less space and re require less trucks. So when trying to design these shows, it's always easy to get carried away and to use more, to make them bigger, to make them better. It's fun, it's exciting. But at some point, we must find ways of creating these spectacles using less and being more economical, less waste. Because after all, it's often said, less is more. I guess we just need to find a balance. Because after all, the events we create do bring happiness to the masses that go to see them, generally. <laughs> and you can't always put a value on that. So during this presentation, the we that I've mentioned throughout, it's not just me or, or Wonderworks. It's a whole team of people involved in the design process, from Roger Waters and his uh, creative director, Sean Evans, who comes up with the creative ideas that we do our best to deliver. And we've got the video director, Richard Turner, lighting director, Pradary Baskerville, and then Tate, uh, one of the suppliers who helped us develop the Rolio roll drops, build the stage, and then uh, Inventions and Airworks here in Holland, uh, who help us with the chimneys and algae. There's also a huge number of production staff uh, on the road with this, keeping it going day in, day out. There's a lot of suppliers, so I have to always remember them. Don't want to take all the credit. Um, and do we have time now for some questions, I guess? Or not? <laughs> No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>